Okay, so let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are very thankful once again that we can be here to study. Yeah. And we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can teach us as we open your word together, as we examine uh, things that we thought we understood. But we know, Lord, that you are going to give us insight into these things uh, beyond uh, human understanding. And so we thank you for that in advance. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can be our teacher and that we can have a revelation of Jesus Christ. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. And continuing this study. Now, just before we get into the uh, reading again, uh, continuing our reading, I want to go back to the question that I had asked. I wonder if anyone has considered it. And the question related to Ellen White giving these messages at the time of Kellogg, telling us to go back to Millerite history. And I asked the question, what's the practical connection between her giving that message and the errors that had crept in, especially in consideration of the medical work? Why is, when we have these problems with the medical work, is she giving a call to go back to Millerite history? Has, has anybody taken time to think about that? I was thinking about it for a while this last night because I went, I was going back over yesterday's meeting, mm -hmm. but there's, you know, it, for me, it's, it's kind of interesting because as we look at these situations, mm -hmm. we try to place these types of instructions into the time frame in which they were given. Now we know that Mrs. White is giving direction that we need to go back to 1843 and 1844. Mm -hmm. and that the, the medical missionary work, the health message began to be given after 1863. Right. So if we were to look at this, um, and I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to try to pull this up very quickly. Okay. Um, So if we, when we look at this, especially, I mean, manuscript releases is another one of those nicely presented group of, of disjointed statements. Yeah. It's kind of, it, it's very interesting for me that this was written in a letter, January 30th, 1906. Yeah, and you're gonna see her messages calling people back to Millerite history in that period from 95, basically. Um, you know, there's about a 10 or 15 year period there that she's doing it, but really specifically in, in 1905, 1906. At the time of Kellogg, well, the issue with the Living Temple. And, and what what I really what what I'm really intrigued with is that the corporate church, in doing the manuscript releases, chose to repeat this particular passage first in 1987 and then in 1993. Hmm. So it's in two different manuscript releases. The one that Jeff referred to here, volume two, uh, page 20, paragraph two, but then it's also repeated in 21 manuscript releases, page 437.4. Oh. So 
when we when we're looking at the at the source document this was written from St. Helena, California to brother and sister E.W. Farnsworth. Okay, so it's uh, in the manuscripts, uh, the source document. What's the source document? What's it called? Thanks. It's letter 54, 1906. Okay. So as she begins this letter, Dear brother and sister Farnsworth, I cannot sleep after 12 o'clock. I'm encouraging souls to examine their own hearts and to seek counsel most earnestly from God. Now is the time for us to afflict our souls by fasting and prayer. We cannot lay out the way in which the Lord will work, but we can follow the leadings and drawings of his Holy Spirit. We shall gain nothing by lifting up our souls unto vanity and in self-confidence. I think that's a very powerful opening statement. Mm -hmm. This I am saying in the visions of the night in assemblies in Battle Creek. If ever the believers in Battle Creek needed the Holy Spirit's guidance, it is now. They need the deep moving of the Spirit of God that they may give the trumpet a certain sound. Now, if we change Battle Creek to Washington, D.C., Mm -hmm. or you know where the the quote unquote center of the work is currently located that warning from 1906 would be just as relevant today as it was then mm -hmm. her advice here is to read the first 11 verses of the 40th chapter of isaiah Present the truth in its power as it is in Jesus. Keep the mind stayed on God and imbued with his Holy Spirit. Present the affirmative of truth. Stand on the platform of the eternal truth, but do not accuse. Say nothing to arouse enmity and strife. Now, your points yesterday regarding the fact that many of the ministers of this era had chosen to set aside the health message was fairly well taken because those seeds have existed to this very day. Now, yeah, and there was this conflict between the medical work and the ministers, you know, between right. the father and the ministers. And, and of course, Kellogg got caught up in spiritualism. But as you were pointing out as well, there were many that did not trust what Kellogg was saying. I mean, they, they saw this as a vegetarian radical mm -hmm. and that his counsel was good for himself and a select few, but that we're Seventh-day Adventists. We partake of that which God has provided. Meat is fine as long as we continue to take and partake of that which is outlined in the law. One of the points that you're trying to make, and one of the points I think that, that Elder Daniel was making, when we look at situations in this way, we are setting aside the first and the second angel's message. We find meat in the courtyard we find the beginnings of a healthy diet in the holy place and we find truly a a god-ordained diet in the most holy because there's elements of consumables in all three but if we hold on to the first angel's message and we choose to set aside the second, we're never benefited by the message of the second angel, and we cannot go forward into the third. Okay. You know, okay and this is going to lead into what we're studying here, dealing with Revelation 10 and 11. Right. Uh, as you probably know. 
um, what we're studying here uh, today, which is something pretty profound. So thanks for that answer. That was well thought out. And you, to sort of sum it up for me, because you're talking about the first and second angels' messages, that this is leading us to the third angel's message. And the third angel's message is on the Day of Atonement. And what do the Jews do on the Day of Atonement? They fast. Correct? Exactly. It's a fast. And so God is calling us to a fast. And, and people wanted to live as if they weren't in the Day of Atonement. So, so understanding the first and second angel's messages were essential just from that point of view. But the other part, dealing with the false ideas of health, because, because that's what I've always seen is these new, up, new age concepts constantly being introduced into the health work, uh, which happened in Kellogg's day and continues to happen in our day. And, and, it's, and it's almost, I mean, it's so insidious that people aren't, aren't aware of what they're doing. I mean, there's people who, conservative Adventists, and they're doing acupuncture, right? Thinking that it's some kind of scientific thing, not realizing it's based on spiritualism. And it works, right? So, so it must be good. <laughs> and and uh, so we have all kinds of things like that. But also just the focus, which tends towards the physical, because there is a connection between the physical and the spiritual. But the physical is not, um, you're not going to subdue the physical uh, without truth. And, and, and so when you're mixing truth and error, it's very, very dangerous. But anyway, we're going we're gonna to go on from that because I know there's, there's lots of lots in that that we could spend time on. Well, if yeah. I may. Yeah. I have attended a fair number of different churches, whether they have been considered liberal or conservative is in the mind of the attendees. Mm -hmm. Now, I find it intriguing because many times when I have attended any of these churches, they have they've chosen that that they're going to have some type of a fellowship meal mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the majority of them like to do their their haystacks mm -hmm. how many times have i walked into an adventist church and seen ellen white's council on diets and foods set aside by having a very large bowl of cheese sitting on the table mm -hmm. so this makes me wonder i mean it's almost like saying that her counsel was good for her time, but we don't need it today because we believe in the Sabbath. Now, diet is hugely related to our spiritual condition. Exactly. And if we are deciding that we are good because we can set aside part of what mrs white has said because we're keeping everything else that's written in scripture it it, it tells a lot of of where we're standing at that point so another point and this this is one from my recent past i had a time where i was asked to come down and give a presentation on the charts to a church that was to a, actually to a group that was a fair number of miles away from me. So I drove down, I spent the Sabbath with these people. And the biggest thing about it is they're saying, you know, Hey, we believe the Sabbath. We believe the charts. We think this is wonderful. And the Lord led me to just to very much make a comment that our spiritual lives are also very clearly denominated 
by an old adage that you are what you eat. The problem was at this particular meeting with these people that believe so, so vocally in the charts that they had decided that the consumption of caffeine, especially that of Pepsi-Cola was fine. Yeah. And I was, I was literally brought to a point after I was done here where I understood I would never be asked to come back to this group again. Yeah, so, so one thing is, you know, health becomes this a very hot topic, um, you know, when people don't want to follow the simple counsel that Ellen White has given us on health, right? Right. And, but you have two extremes. You have those that disregard, um, you know, the simple counsel. And then there's those that add all kinds of things to that counsel that, that never, that she never says. Right. So, I mean, I've been to meetings where, um, you know, supposedly a health presentation and they tell us about all these things that are bad for us. Uh, tomatoes, potatoes, um, well, yeah, that's nightshades or all kinds of other things that we shouldn't be eating, that we have no counsel in, in, in the spirit of prophecy that we shouldn't eat these things. Now, it's true. There are some people who may not want to eat nightshades. They may have a reaction to them. Uh, and there's all kinds of other things too. Um, you know, different ways we're supposed to eat or how often we're supposed to eat or how much we're supposed to eat or how often we have to chew our food, um, that they make these things become like salvational issues, but yet they neglect other things, other counsel on health. Um, so I, I think it's important that one is we all take the counsel that Ellen White gives us and we follow it, especially as we're convicted by it. But I don't like to see the strange fire mixed in with the health message, because that's really the way that I see it. Uh, I've seen the health message done right, and I've seen it done uh, wrong. So, but I think the answer, the question is, how does going back to the foundation of this message help in these areas? And uh, so from just a very practical point of view, when we go back and we start to examine the messages that God has given, it leads us on step by step in, in reform. And so we're going to see this here as we go through these passages dealing with Revelation 10 and Revelation 11. Now, Jeff is going to start here with Revelation 10, saying, Thou must prophesy again. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And, and then it's going to go to 11 verse 1. Now, we have these chapter divisions, um, which I believe are in God's providence, especially with a lot of the numbers. But often when you have a chapter division, we sort of disregard the previous chapter. And when we start to begin the next chapter. So is there a connection here to Revelation 10, verse 11, and 11, verse 1? And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship him. So what would be the connection? Why is Jeff putting these two verses together and in a sense ignoring the chapter division? Chapter 10 ends with the uh, disappointment, right, which so is the, the beginning of the judgment. Right. So it, it begins judgment, with the judgment, yeah. the end of the disappointment. Now, now we know this symbol, thou must prophesy again. Um, in this movement, we came to understand the number 153 uh, related to that. And somebody asked me this question recently, you know, how do I understand? How are we saying? Um, that um, uh, that the 153 fishes 
in um, it's in uh, it's in John, I believe, isn't it? Or is it in I'm trying to remember where it is? Yeah, I'll find it quickly. That's in yeah, John chapter twenty one. So share the screen. So in John chapter one, we have uh, Jesus coming, he comes into the morning at, um, after Simon Peter and the others were fishing all night. And he says, Jesus saith unto them, children, have ye any meat? Verse five, they answered no. And he said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship and you shall find. And they cast their board, now they were not able to draw it in or to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, so that's John, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. And Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. And Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of great fishes, an hundred and fifty-three. For all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Now, in this story, we know, of course, that Jesus called um, them to become fishers of men. And now they go back to their old trade of fishing. So we took the position that this symbol of 153 means to prophesy again. And, and that's based upon the idea that Christ is now going to talk to Peter and basically once again renew um, his work that he is responsible for, which is to be fishers of men. Now, this number 153 has lots of characteristics. One is we know that it's the number of days from Samuel Snow's first letter uh, to the July 18th letter. So it has this connection with July 18th. Um, and also we know from uh, the number of days from August 11th, 1840 to October 22nd, 1844 is 1,533, so it's 153 with a three on. And so we, we, we take those symbols to be the same symbol. Now, any thoughts on this, on this prophesying again and the 153? And probably Stephen has some thoughts on it, but maybe someone else does. Do we have a solid basis to say that the symbol of the 153 fishes is to prophesy again? I don't know. I don't have a response for your, your question. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Because uh, people question it. I mean, people have said, well, why are you saying it means prophesy again? Now, I'm the one who said that it did initially. I told Jeff this, and Jeff has used this. Um, but I don't know if it's really been explained well, other than, you know, we have this story. And, and we can relate it to Millerite history. So if you're going to take the 1533 and then say, well, that, that's the same as the 153, then we would say on October 22nd, 1844, the message that's given in Revelation chapter 10, right at the very end. And he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many people's nations, tongues, and kings. Is that same message that's being given to John and Peter in John chapter 21? Does that make sense to people? Yeah, it does make some sense. Okay. Now, also in Revelation 10, remember that this, thou must prophesy again, 
comes after he's told to take this book and to eat it. Now, we know in Millerite history, that's going to be uh, the message that they are given, and it's going to be sweet in their mouth, but it's going to be bitter in their belly. belly. And the bitterness is the disappointment, right? So the sweetness is the message, but the bitterness is the disappointment. And then it says, thou must prophesy again. So, so this is talking about that disappointment and about the giving of that message. And, that, that, and that's based upon the little book, because what they're going to eat is the little book, which is the book of Daniel that's open in the hand of the angel. So how would we relate this to our time? And what does it mean to prophesy again as well for the Millerites and then for us once we relate it to our time? Because has this movement said that we need to eat the little book? Yes, many times. Yeah. So it, it's part of our message. And, and if we're going to eat the little book, we know that it's going to be sweet in our mouths and bitter in our bellies. By July 18th, that was, that was sweet. That was well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was, right? But yeah. we expect it to be sweet, but not bitter. Right. Okay. Now, when it comes to thou must prophesy again, how do we take this in our tongue? And, and just think of Millerite history. After a disappointment, just continue on, take up the work again. Okay. So after, so, so after July 18. Right. So they're going to take up the work again. But we know that once they take up the work again after October 22nd, 1844, they do have a new message. Right. So there, so so it's implied that when you prophesy again, that a change has happened in the message itself. Because you have your first message, the message that's going to be sweet in your mouth. And then you're going to have this experience. And then from that experience, you're now going to prophesy again. But this time, in this prophesying again. You have a message that, that is based upon the previous message, but there's something new added to it. Am, am, I, am I just making that assumption, or is that something that's implied? Well, after the disappointment, they weren't preaching. The Lord's going to come in the clouds. Right. And, uh, the 10th day of the seventh month. Right. So, so they have a different message because, but, but that message, part of it has to do with their experience as well. And, and, and this, I think, is the problem for Seventh-day Adventists. Because when Adventists look back, I think one of the reasons why we don't like Millerite history is because of the failure, failed prediction. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, from what I've seen, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Adventists look at this as a failure. It, one is because the world looks at it as a failure. And Adventists don't like to be seen as being part of a group that was in error. And I think one of the, the strongest reasons why Millerite history is, is pretty much ignored by most Adventists, even if they, they know about it, is that they see Millerism as a failure. Miller was wrong. And, and we can take the same application to July 18th. There are people who are going to look at July 18th and say, 
say, well, Jeff was wrong and, and we just need to move on. But for, but for the Millerites, the foundation and central pillar um, that Adventism is going to draw from the Millerites is the 2300 days in connection with the sanctuary. And, and without that foundation of the first and second angels' messages, you don't have that. Now, when we go back and, and look at our history as we're doing here, we know that this movement made mistakes because Jeff said he made mistakes and he, he can and we can see some of those mistakes that he made initially and we can see that all through there are things that we don't understand but we're following what God has directed us to do and in doing so we come to this prediction that fails but the, that prediction is not a failure any more than October 22nd 1844 was a failure. Because God led in that, and he had a purpose in it. And we've been able to see that based upon the events that have occurred afterwards and the structure of the chronology that's being unfolded as we pass through this time. So we're now going to move, though, from this prophesying again that the Millerites are going to do. And they're going to move into this measurement of the temple. Now... We know that this relates to Ezekiel chapter 40, um, that we have a parallel here. So Ezekiel 40, he's going to have a reed um, that's going to be 126 inches. And he's going to use that as the measuring reed for measuring the temple. Now, what do we take the measuring of the temple to be? What does it symbolize? Measuring can relate to a judgment. Okay, so it relates to judgment. So, and I think that most, most commentators would recognize that, that it relates to judgment. So there's a, a judgment going on, and Seventh-day Adventists would take Revelation 11.1 1, and place that at October 22nd, 1844, and that God's people are being measured or judged. Um, so when it says rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar and them that worship therein, um, we're going to see that this is about a, the judgment of God's people. Now, of course, it's, it's measuring the people as well as the altar, which, which I think is an interesting point. But it's, and then it says in verse 2, but the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Now, when we were studying Ezekiel and we looked at the measurements, what did we find that the measurements represented? Time. Well, time, right? So we can see that Ezekiel, the measurements there address time. Now, a lot of commentators have different views about Ezekiel's temple. Some people, of course, take it that it's a temple that's going to be built in the future. Um, we take it as that it's a symbolic temple that's never going to be built in a literal sense. But that that temple or that measurement that Ezekiel is doing represents the time periods that are going to lead up to Revelation 11 verse 1. Correct. Agreed. And that in Ezekiel, uh, it's a building of a temple. But here in Revelation 11, you already have the temple built. So what was, how was the temple built? Uh, why is Ezekiel addressing the building of this temple? And how was it built? And why is it completed in Revelation 11? One. Because what is Ezekiel addressing, really? building of a church of yeah. people okay the building of the church of the people now the temple had been destroyed by the time he's writing um ezekiel chapter 40 when he has that vision 
it's going to be um, because uh, that's going to be in 473 uh, or 573 BC. Pardon me, I always do that. 573 BC, and the temple was destroyed um, in 586. So this is going to be what we would call 13 years later. Okay. So, so it's going to be 13, what he says, I think is the 14th year from when the city was smitten. So, so you're going to have this, this temple that had been destroyed. And now he's going to talk about the building of the temple, but he's not going to be talking about the building of a literal temple, even though a literal temple will be built um, under the decrees of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes. That's not what he's addressing. He's addressing this restoration of a temple, which is a church or a people, in these time periods or these prophecies. And we're going to see that these prophecies relate to the time periods that we understand already from the book of Daniel. Uh, there's a, a lot more detail, though, too. One is we're going to start to see things that relate to our time as well. Um, and, of course, we see the 2520 represented and... Um, the prophetic mirror represented. There's lots of different things that we found in Ezekiel. But now we're going to get to Revelation 11, verse 1 and 2, where it's going to talk about the measuring of this temple. So this is the judgment. So there's a measurement of the temple that's done in measuring it to build it, how big to build it. But now when we get here in Revelation 11, 1, and it says, measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. One is, we did spend quite a bit of time on the altar when we were studying Ezekiel. And also the temple. But now, we, there wasn't in Ezekiel any measurement of the worshipers. So why are the worshipers now being measured? I mean, we sort of answered it, but... Um, Could we say that this is because they their measurement is to see if their characters measure up? Yeah, so so they're they're being judged, right? So that's why we're measuring them. Now remember the measuring always had to do with time. So if we're gonna say that measurement has to do with time, even though it's it's a type of judgment. Uh, what would it mean that the worshipers are now being measured? Um, not just the temple and not just the altar. If they had uh, accepted the time that had passed, okay. it's an aspect of there being measured whether they believe that experience they went through and the time prophecies that were given. Okay. Yeah. So the worshipers are accepting the time prophecies, right? Those are the ones that are going to be judged. Now, my next thought, may, maybe people might think I'm stretching it a little bit, but our lives are being measured. And a part of the, the symbols that come into play in this movement have been the events in the lives of those involved in the movement. You can see that if you watch Daniel Vanderhorst's uh, recent video, right? Where, and, and as other, other videos as well. But events in his life now come to play in prophetic ways, as symbols, as numbers. I've had that in my own life, um, whether it's my baptism on December 25th, 1982, or the date that I was born, or my marriages, um, or the day that I met Heidi, all of these things are part of the prophetic time. And, and Stephen has the same thing with his birthday. Now, I would say that all of those who are being measured, we all become symbols. And, and why would God do that? 
uh, because some people think it's very um, egocentric. But why is God doing this? Why is he incorporating time, which is part of our lives, into this measurement? And I don't know, people might think I'm stretching things a bit. But I think this is pretty relevant myself because we've seen time, time in all kinds of events, times in our lives. Um, so when we're looking at this period of time from October 22nd, 1844 to the second coming, when, the, when Ellen White says there's time no longer after October 22nd, 1844, and yet we see time, we see time as a measurement, as part of judgment. And why is that? I, I know it's kind of an obscure question. Because why does God have time at all? Why do we have time prophecies? Why has time been given to us prophetically? You can say this earth is under a, a period of probation. Okay, so it's under a period of probation. So that's an important point that, that this earth is temporary. It, and it's created at the beginning with time, the sun, the moon, the stars, right? So God's given us time and they're for signs, for seasons, for days and for years. And, and then we can see that that's part of the judgment. Time is a part of that. Now, in the, yeah. Excuse me. In the beginning, time was cyclical and was meant to be eternal cycles. But now, since sin has entered, our time is also linear, heading, you know, things begin and then end. Right. And so, we're looking for the final end. Right. So, so time is cyclical because the world rotates and the, goes around the sun and so forth. But when it comes to a line or a prophetic line, it's not cyclical. It has a beginning and an end, right? So time is, is something that's, that interrupts that cycle that would just be eternal and places us temporally into um, God's prophecy. So now the next verse and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy, prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Well, actually, even if we go back to the preceding verse, right, maybe we should look at that in a bit more detail first before we go to verse three. But the court which is without the temple leave out. So this is the outer court. So it's going to be left out of this measurement and measure it not for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot 40 and two months. Now, when it says that it's, it's not going to be measured, but they're going to tread underfoot the, this holy city 40 and two months. There is a type of measurement that's being done to the court, but what's not being measured during the 1260 years. Again, I'm not sure if I'm asking the question well, but because what is the court that's not going to be measured? Gentiles. The Gentiles. Okay, so let, let's go to, to Jeff's study on this. So I figured I would go through that a little bit first, but we're going to start to see that Jeff brings these things out rather well. Uh, so he's going to start with this measure. The grand judgment is taking place and has been going on for some time. Now the Lord says, measure the temple and the worshipers thereof. Remember, when you are walking the streets about your business, God is measuring you. When you are attending your household duties, when you engage in conversation, that God is measuring you. 
Remember that your words and actions are being daguerreotyped, which is photographed in the books of heaven as the face is rep reproduced by the artist on the polished plate. So that's from Sermon and Talks, volume two, page 53. But the court which is without the temple, so he's gonna quote these verses, uh, verse two and so forth. Uh, Leave out, measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot 40 and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy. 1,203 score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and the power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. So we know that this is talking about God's word and that it's going to, pro it's going to testify uh, during the period of 1260 years and that uh, it's God's word that prophesies it has the power to shut heaven, that it rain not, etc. So this is just describing that this is God's word, that this is prophecy. And, and we get the two olive trees and the two candlesticks that comes from Zechariah. And we, we've studied that before in other studies. Um, and when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit, which is atheism, spiritualism, France, right, shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them, right? So this is going to refer to a period of time during the French Revolution. So, so Jeff is going to give us some quotes that help us understand this. Um, measure not the outer court. In the temple at Jerusalem, there was a partition wall separating the outer court from the inner one. Gentiles were permitted to enter the outer court, but it was only lawful for the Jews to penetrate to the inner enclosure. Had a Samaritan passed this sacred boundary, the temple would have been desecrated and his life would have paid the penalty of its pollution. So it's Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, 149, 150. In Ministry of Healing, page 20, Ellen White says, Christ taught often in the outer court of the temple that the Gentiles might hear his words. And Signs of the Times, December 10th, 1894, the time was approaching when he should leave his followers, but he promised them that the Spirit should come to lead them into all truth, to illuminate to their minds the scriptures which he had himself given to patriarchs and prophets. No longer were the Gentiles to be kept in heathenism, or as it were, in the outer courts of the temple. So, what is the outer court according to the spirit of prophecy here? Both literally and, and symbolically. Yeah, those who aren't the people of God. Okay, so those that aren't the people of God, so in this case, Gentiles, the nations, the ones who aren't Jews, they're in this, they have access to God through this outer court. Um, so how would we relate this to the prophetic lines? In... Well, we're definitely inside the outer court. Okay. Um... <clears throat> and we've been given the knowledge of the interior workings of the temple and its services there. Okay. Um, okay, I'm just going to go to the whiteboard and illustrate this here. So we've done similar things like this in the book of Ezekiel. But could we say this? That this is the outer court. Can we say that? 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you got this 1260 years. This is the outer court. And so when is the measuring going to begin? 1798. 1844. Okay. So we're going to say the measuring begins here. Now, why is it not beginning in 1798? It was just after the disappointment and uh, described in Revelation 10. Right. And then... so, so we're going to have this here. Um, so could we call this the eating of the little book? And then this is the bitterness. Can we do that? Let's see why not. Yeah. Okay. Now, so is is there any kind of measuring going on here? The reception or rejection of the first and second angel's messages. Okay. Um so so we would call, you know, this is a reform line, right? We have the outer court. Now, we, we are going to also call this darkness, right? And then you're going to have this increase of light, and you're going to have uh, these messages here. But we're going to say that the measuring of the temple doesn't happen here. Now, this eating of the little book, um, how does this relate to the temple at all? Because the temple has been built. Now, the temple has been built, if, if we're going to go back to Ezekiel, we know that Ezekiel has these symbols of these time prophecies. Now, some of these time prophecies are going to deal with, with this history. Um, but is there anything related to the temple in this history? So you have the building of the temple. You have that it's going to be completed. We know the sanctuary is going to be cleansed. Um, but the measuring is going to happen here. So what's happening here? The 46 years are the building of the temple. Okay. Well, so they, they do symbolize the building of the temple. Right? So there's something going on there. Okay. Because that's how Jeff has taken this. This is the building of the temple. It's going to go on. How else does it relate to the temple? Okay, let's look at this. This is the most holy place, right? After the temple is completed, then it is cleansed. Okay. And then, like, sanctified for service. But we do know that this is the holy place, right? So, so we have a couple of illustrations that kind of parallel each other or go together. We know that we represent this as the building of the temple, but this is also still holy place ministration. Now this has been going on for a long time, but if this is the outer court, can you say in 1798, we enter into the holy place? Can, can we say that? Yes. Okay, why? I think it has to do with the knowledge that the increase of light eating the little book. When we understand where we are, then we enter into that part of the Well, did Miller understand in 1798 or even anywhere in this history that they were in the holy place ministration? No, not at the beginning. The light increased as they went along and they figured it out somewhere in the process. Okay. Now, I'm not really happy with that answer. No, I'm just shooting off. I, I, know, I know. I know. So, so you know, let's let's think about this more. Um, 
because we know that Christ begins his holy place ministry in 31 AD. So can we relate any of this history to 31 AD? We could say it's a parallel history. It's okay. They began to understand Jesus' heavenly ministry, the Holy Spirit's ministry had begun, and, and the Millerites understood this change from the holy place to the most holy place. Okay, they understood that here. I mean, but, but we say that, you know, there's an understanding that must happen here. Now, we know there's an increase of light. So under the first angel's message, they're giving a message that the hour of God's judgment has come, right? And they're, point, they're going to be pointing forward to gradually, because he's not going to understand this in 1798. But that's going to be the first angel's message. And then you're going to have the second angel's message, right? That's going to arrive on April 18th. Um, but it's, it's going to be empowered on August 15th. And then, of course, you're going to have the third angel arrives here. So how does this relate to the holy place? What are these three? There's three pieces of furniture in the holy place. Okay, well, you could say that. How about this? Um. That's part of our message that we've given. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. Is this, is, is this three-step testing prophetic message, um, is the, are the first two in particular, do they relate to the holy place, the work that goes on in the holy place in, in the life of the believer? Yes. Yeah. Sin, righteous, holiness. Okay. okay. So, so we know that when we get to the Day of Atonement, that that's actually when the judgment begins, right? Because the sinner has a conviction of sin, right? He's going to bring his offering to the door of the temple, and then the priest is going to minister that. So... And the priest takes it to the altar of incense. The horns of the altar of incense. Um, well, that would be the prayers. Doesn't he take the blood and touch the horns of the individual of the altar of incense? Not of the individual sinner, but but yeah, I mean, in some of the ceremonies he does. But Christ actually takes our sins upon him as the high priest he's going to bear them right but then you're going to have the judgment now in the judgment there this this most holy place ministration is for god's people right but christ who is bearing our sins at the end of that when probation closes so part of this day of judgment is going to address the one who is the instigator of sin, Satan, which is represented by the scapegoat. And then Christ is going to take those sins, confess them upon the head of the scapegoat. So that's, that's all part of this work that goes on in the most holy place or on the day of atonement. But we know that the high priest has a ministry in the holy place as well as the most holy um, that, that he has to do. But we would say this is the holy place ministration. That is, we come to understand something in this history, the first, second, and third angel's message. So the first and second angel's messages, can we say that this is the holy place and the third angel's message is the most holy? Can we say that? Yeah. I, I think we can. So, <clears throat> so let's go back to... I think there's been lots of studies done comparing the altar of incense to the sin, the uh, 
candlestick to righteousness and the showbread to judgment. Okay, I Don't would. Ask me who I, I would not agree with that. So, I think that's just a misapplication. Um, that that doesn't make any sense, based on my understanding. I could be wrong, but based on my understanding, that would be a misapplication to try to make uh, to do that. Um, and I, I've seen tons of things that people try to do with the sanctuary that I don't think is supported by the Bible or spirit of prophecy. That is, it's merely speculation without a thus saith the Lord. So unless somebody can give me a thus saith the Lord really clearly, I, I don't see how you could make that application regarding uh, the furniture in the holy place, but maybe there's something I've missed. Um, so anyway, as we go on here, um, we're, we're going to address this wall of partition. Uh, the opinion is held by many that God placed a separating wall between the Hebrews and the outside world, that his care and love withdrawn to a great extent from the rest of mankind were centered upon Israel. But God did not design that his people should build up a wall of partition between themselves and their fellow men. So if you're dealing with this outer court where there is a wall, um, God is illustrating something, but what he's not illustrating is that he wants to have a division between uh, peoples, that, that salvation is open to everyone. So that's not what he's illustrating by this outer court. The partition wall which Jewish pride had erected to shut even the disciples from sympathy with the heathen world, but these barriers were to be broken down. So that one, first one is prophets and uh, patriarchs and prophets 368. This is desire of ages 400. And from the signs of the times, October 9th, 1886, the Jews had erected a partition wall between themselves and every other people, but this was not after the direction of the Lord. So even though you have this division wall in the temple, that's after the direction of God, but to take that and apply that and to create a partition wall between God's people and every other people as the Jews did, this was not after the direction of the Lord. So they had a misunderstanding of what that court of the Gentiles meant, what that wall meant that divided between the Jews who could enter into the temple and the Gentiles who could not. Uh, priests and rulers had interposed themselves between the people and God, and they sought to interpose between them and the great teacher, even as they do in this day. How great will be the responsibility of men who seek to hinder souls from entering into the kingdom of heaven. The whole tenor of Christ's teaching was contrary to that of the rabbis. In his Sermon on the Mount, he tore away the middle wall of partition that separated men one from another through national prejudices and taught the exercise of a love that was to embrace the human race. So when we look at the line that I drew there and, and you start to, you, you recognize that, you know, there's the, the 1260 years of papal persecution and then there's 1798, you have this, uh, end of the 2520 for Northern Israel, and you're going to have a gathering that's going to occur. Protestants now in the United States are going to be studying their Bible. Miller's going to be one of them, and he's going to lead a movement that is going to call the Protestants by this first angel's message to an understanding of prophecy that's going to lead to the second angel's message and that second angel's message is going to be another step that's going to lead to the third angel's message. And that third angel's message is connected with the cleansing of the sanctuary, the work of judgment on the Day of Atonement that's being done, and the judgment of God's people, and also to the Sabbath, and the truths connected with God's word that are connected to this message. Right, so the understanding of the state of the dead, for instance, is connected, even though it's not. It's you know, it's um, 
the state of the dead. Uh, what, what's the importance of the state of the dead in relationship to the Sabbath and the judgment? Uh, if anybody could sort of express that. Why is the state of the dead become important after 1844? The uh, natural immortality of the soul maintains that the judgment happens when we die, either go straight to heaven or hell. Right. But so, we put that off into the future. Right. So we know oh. that, that, I mean, you do get, there's given unto man once to die and after that the judgment. But that the judgment and entering into heaven and God's kingdom doesn't happen at death. That there's a historical point in history when that occurs. Now, we know, of course, that the state of the dead is tied up with spiritualism and so forth. And Satan is the originator of this idea, ye shall not surely die. And it becomes developed in all these religions and becomes adopted through paganism into Christianity. So the Jews never believed in the immortal soul in the time of Christ or ever until long after that, that they started to slowly adopt these ideas. And even then, Jews don't really fully embrace that idea as much as Christians do. But what we see here is that if you're going to understand the judgment and, and prophecy, if you have a wrong idea of the state of the dead, none of that would make sense. So understanding the state of the dead is essential if you're going to understand the investigative judgment and you know the great white throne judgment that's going to happen after the thousand years and so forth. Revelation wouldn't make any sense if you believe that once you die, you go directly to heaven or to some eternally burning hell. It totally destroys the great controversy and, and pretty much anything in the Bible. So it, it's really not compatible with scripture. Um, but anyway, uh, I bring that up because, you know, we have this period of time and we're going to have these new truths that are going to unfold after October 22nd, 1844. And, um, in Christ's day, there was truths that had to be removed, and the same thing in our day. Now, so Jeff doesn't develop it as much as I would have liked to see him deal with this, but he did give us um, some pretty clear things uh, to look at. Now, he's going to talk, this is from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 to 22. So he's going to address this middle wall of partition. He's going to use these passages here and some Spirit of Prophecy quotes. Um, so, wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain, or both, one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. And then Paul says, it's sort of as a summation, now therefore ye are, were, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth up unto, unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for the habitation of God through the Spirit. So there's lots of stuff here, but we can see then, if you're going to take the line that I drew, and you're going to look at the Gentiles. So you're going to have the Gentiles. This is the times of the Gentiles, the two 1260s. And they're going to end in 1798. 
So what people are going to arise in 1798? Who's the group that shows up in 1798? Um, are you thinking of uh, the Millerites? Well, okay, it's gonna be the Millerites, not in 1798, you're gonna have Protestants, right? So you're going to have Protestants. They show up in 1798. And Protestants are Gentiles, correct? Yes. Okay. So you're going to have now, these Gentiles are going to show up in 1798. And this is a reform message. The, the only name I could think of was Sardis, the name of the church. Okay. Well, yeah. So you have the church Sardis, right? And, and we could look at that. Um, and, and look at that illustration. I don't think we need to, but, but we could. Um, so here you have the Protestants, which are Gentiles. And at the end, at the end of the 1260, you're going to have a people that are now going to be connected. You're, you're going to have a development of God's people. So the Jews were being tested in Christ's time, Correct. That's the group that's part of that reform line. Right. So you don't see Gentiles there as, as such until, until the end, right? In 34 AD at the stoning of Stephen, you're going to have the gospel go to the Gentiles. Um, but the Jews are going to be tested there at the setting up of that work um, of Christ in the holy place. But now you're going to have a repeat of history. But the group that's going to be in this repeat of history is not Jews. It's going to be Gentiles. Gentiles are going to have their opportunity to enter into the work of the holy place. Now, of course, they were in 34 AD. But this is a reform line. And it's a repeat of that previous history. Because you're going to have a falling away. You're going to have uh, the four churches, you know, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, and Thyatira. You're going to have that is going to be a progressive destruction of four. Even though the gospel had gone to the Gentiles, they're now in 1798. Protestants, they've gone through the Protestant Reformation. And now in 1798, they're going to be God's people, Gentiles, that are going to enter into this holy place ministration in connection with the cleansing of the sanctuary that's going to come. And so it says here, but you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So we can see that there's a building that needs to occur, that they have to grow into a holy temple in the Lord. And, and that that work, which was supposed to begin in the time of Christ, failed, but it's now going to be reenacted in Millerite history. Does that make sense to people? Yeah, I see that as, as a cycle that has repeated. Uh, God chose Abraham as his, his primary teacher. The word expanded almost to the world. And then they became Zeus, uh, the commission to teach the world. Uh, but that failed, so he went to the Protestants with the commission to teach the world. Uh, but that family had to come out with a new purified core group, which was the Millerites or Adventists, now are worldwide with the commission to teach the world. Right, so you have these repeats. So it's a cycle. Yeah. Like, well, uh, unfortunate failures. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm, so I would put it that way. I, I wouldn't say they're unfortunate failures. I think they're necessary failures in order for God to, to meet his purpose. Um, I mean, I guess on the one hand, you could say they're unfortunate, but one is I don't like the word fortunate because I don't believe in fortune. Um, so I would say they're actually in God's providence. So that's quite a bit different than unfortunate. But nonetheless, we know that 
at the end of the world, at the time of the end in 1798, you now have this reform line, which particularly is for the Gentiles, the Protestants, the ones who are not Jews, because we now have spiritual Israel, literal Israel failed. The Jews are no longer God's denominated people in 34 AD at the stoning of Stephen. And yet this, this period of time is going to be a progressive destruction of four. You're not going to have a reform line for the Gentiles in 34 AD. You're going, they're going to have to go through this experience that's going to lead to 1798. And now you have Protestants coming out of this uh, period of persecution. And you have the enemy. You're going to have um, the um, Satanism or, or atheism rising in France, trying to counteract the word because you're going to have, I mean, they're going to be killing Protestants before that, but they're going to try to destroy God's word. That's what atheism is going to do. And, and of course, it's not going to succeed. And when it fails, you're going to see uh, God's word standing up, and you're going to see in 1798 the beginning of all these Bible societies that are going to expand. God's word is going to be everywhere, and Protestants are going to have this opportunity to accept these truths that are going to be unfolded from God's word, and it's going to come through a prophetic message. So this prophetic message now is going to be the building of this temple. But when you get to the third message, it's now going to call them into the most holy place. But you can't get to the most holy place unless you've been in the holy place. And Protestants have to go through that experience. And that is a prophetic message, a three-step testing prophetic message. Now, the second angel's message is, is the message that begins after the first angel's message, of course. But the second angel's message is the message of righteousness. And it's going to be the message that many are going to fail in. That is, in order to receive the third angel's message, which is judgment, because that's what the third angel's message is, is judgment, you have to pass the test of the second angel's message. And, and most are going to fail in that. And then you're going to have, of course, a reform line in our time. But we still have, we still are in the Day of Atonement. But now God's people are not literal Jews. It's spiritual Israel. And God also has a denominated people. Seventh-day Adventists are his denominated people, just as the Jews were. So and there's we lots have of our scribes and Pharisees just as the Jews did. <laughs> Yeah, but, that, but that's not really pertinent to the discussion right now, because what we want to look at is this reform line and to understand what Jeff is laying down. So what Jeff is laying down here, based upon these statements, is that this building of the temple, which happened from 1798 to 1844, has to also occur in our line, because without the preparation... You can't have the close of probation. That is, in order for, for Christ to stand up, for Michael to stand up, right? And say, him that is righteous be righteous still, him that is filthy be filthy still. A work has to precede that. And this work now is going to be going on for every person on the planet. Everyone is having this opportunity. That's what this message is about. It's about a preparation for the close of the judgment. Now, we know, of course, October 22nd, 1844, began the judgment of the righteous dead. Now, why is that? Why do we have the judgment of the righteous dead and then the judgment of the living? I mean, this seems, seems kind of odd. Uh, unless you understand it correctly, because many Adventists do not understand this point. And, and Parmind Parminder used this lack of understanding to bring in a bunch of confusions. I don't know how many people are aware of what he said about this. 
but um, we're going to come back to that. I want to read some more statements before we close here, uh, just to add some more information to what we're discussing. As Jesus hung up on the cross and cried, it is finished, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. To signify that God would no longer meet with the priests in the temple to accept their sacrifices and ordinances, and also to show that the partition wall was broken down between the Jews and the Gentiles. Jesus had made an offering of himself for both, and if saved at all, both must believe in Jesus as the only offering for sin and the Savior of the world. So we can see how God moved from this chosen people that was to be a light to lighten the Gentiles. They failed in their mission, but Christ coming and dying upon the cross completed that mission, or at least completed the first stage of that mission that, that was then to be um, realized as you started to see for the first time after the time of Christ that the understanding that the Jews had started to become uh, the gospel that was going to the world. If you think about it, you know, Jews were the ones who had the scriptures. But after the 70 weeks, we see that the gospel is now going to the Gentiles. And it's going to, through that period of time, the 504 years of persecution by pagan paganism, and then finally, the 1260 years persecution by papalism. It doesn't stop the gospel. The gospel is going to go everywhere. The Christian church was at this time entering upon an important era. The work of proclaiming the gospel message was now to be prosecuted with vigor among the Gentiles and the church as a result was to be strengthened by a great ingathering of souls. The apostles who had been appointed to lead out in this special work, would be exposed to suspicion, prejudice, and jealousy. Their teachings concerning the breaking down of the middle wall of partition that had so long been maintained between the Jewish and Gentile world would naturally subject them to the charge of heresy, and their credentials as ministers of the gospel would be questioned by many zealous believing Jews. God foresaw the difficulties that his servants would be called upon to meet. And in order that their work should be above challenge, he caused them to be investigated with unquestionable authority, or invested, pardon me, with unquestionable authority from his established church. Their ordination was a public recognition of their divine appointment to bear to the Gentiles the glad tidings of the gospel. Review and Herald, May 11th. 1911. The same agencies that barred men from Christ 1800 years ago are at work today. The spirit which built up the partition wall between Jew and Gentile is still active. Pride and prejudice have built strong walls of separation between different classes of men. Christ and his mission have been misrepresented, and multitudes feel that they are virtually shut away from the ministry of the gospel. But let them not feel that they are shut away from Christ. There are no barriers which man or Satan can erect, but that faith can penetrate. So we can see that our mission is a call to the world, and that, and, and, and what I said there, be, you know, before I read the Review and Herald quote, I mean, you can see it clearly illustrated there of, of what that mission was for the Christians in Christ's day. Now, is there a a barrier that has been erected in our time. Oh, yes. Okay, what is it? We have the same, well, like it's what I alluded to earlier. We have our own scribes and Pharisees within Adventism. And uh, Adventists have become pretty exclusive. Mm -hmm. uh, some are inclusive, but many are not. Sometimes the inclusive ones are condemned for being overly liberal. Maybe we're too inclusive in some ways. Um, okay, well. I guess we, the Jews didn't have the inclusiveness. Okay, so 
you're trying to equate um, what the middle wall of partition that existed in Christ's day with the way that Seventh-day Adventists consider themselves better than other people in, in our day. Yeah, we've all seen. Well, I, and I don't think that's completely wrong, but I, I don't know if that's that's the point that I would bring out. Um, because I don't, I, I don't think it, I, yeah, yeah. I just don't think it's a real parallel. That is, um, I would say that many Adventists are very inclusive. Um, you know especially the liberal ones. So, because what they're doing is they're looking back at the history in the time of Christ and they're trying not to repeat it. But yeah. often when they do that, people just re do the same error in a different way. Right. So, so I would say that the, the wall of partition exists within Adventism. It's not out Adventism and the world. Adventism and sinners, but it's a separation wall that exists within Adventism. Oh, yes. Adventism is fractured into a thousand small sects who set up walls between themselves and everybody else. Okay. They yeah. can't be saved unless you see every bite of food 21 times. Okay. So, what's the barrier? Because there's one barrier that exists within Adventism. I guess it's the spiritual pride. Okay. 25, 20. Okay. That's closer to what I'm thinking of. It's the, it, so. I couldn't make out what he said. He said the 25, 20. So, so I oh, think. that's that, a big one. I think that's closer. So I think that the, the, the wall of separation that exists within Adventism is between those that are accepting of new light and those that aren't. That, that would be the simple way to look at it. Now, the ones who I agree. tend to be in a, a close to new light are the ones who are in control, for the most part, of the church. So, but when we say that this barrier needs to be broken down, one of the things, you know, I personally have a problem with is I really don't like Seventh-day Adventists. So I never liked them. I, I don't find them interesting. Um, like Gandhi and his Christians. Yeah. So, I mean, because from where I come from, Seventh-day Adventists are, they're not really my kind of people. I, I wouldn't really associate with them. If, if I was just, you know, had my choice, except that I'm a Seventh-day Adventist and, you know, I, I believe in the truths of Adventism, but I've never really enjoyed the fellowship of Seventh-day Adventists in a general sense. Obviously, there's individuals that I really like, but those tend to be really in the minority within Adventism. So, you know, I have the same problem in the sense that I'm somewhat separated from Adventism. And when we think about giving the message to the Levites, you know, in my mind, I'm going to imagine, well, you know, those people that are like me, you know, they're interested in Bible truths. Uh, they're not so square. Um, um, you know, they're, they're kind of open and honest people. Those are the people I like. But yet our, our message is to be two Seventh-day Adventists. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, you know, I, I don't want to be misunderstood by that, but I'm really trying to state my case. I, I agree completely. And, and I'm looking for something that will happen to break the ice, to open them up. Then they'll pay more attention to us. Well, it's going to have to be something in us. That's what has to happen. I mean... It's not going to be some external thing. Um, you know, I, I can say that I have a lot to do with the barriers that exist between me and 
Seventh-day Adventists. You know, and, and even if there's stuff that they're doing, I have no control over that, but I do have control over who I am. And uh, so that's something that we have to consider. Now, one of the things I really liked about this movement, when I first came to this movement uh, in 2010, and I was at the, um, the, the meetings in Oklahoma, um, I was quite surprised. That is, I'd been part of, of different movements like Light Bears Ministry. And, and Light Bears Ministry, it was, you know, all the guys wore suspenders, all the women wore dresses. I mean, it was a conservative Adventist movement, at least when it started. And, and people pretty much were the same as me. But when I went to Oklahoma, and I don't know how many people were at the Oklahoma meetings, but I was quite surprised at the cross section that existed in the movement, the cross section, not just of, of uh, you know, the economic cross section, because pretty much light bears was all just marginal whites. Um, but what, what we had is, is the diversity of, of class, uh, but also a diversity of personalities and, and types of people. Lots of people that, you know, I wouldn't naturally like because um, they're the kind of people that annoy me, but they were all there. So it was a completely different movement than I had seen in before. Um, so I don't think it was just appealing to uh, the really ultra conservative Adventists. Um, it actually appealed to people that I would call liberals, not necessarily liberals because they weren't following the truth but much more liberal in personality. Um, so I think that this movement has had this um, attraction to a wide range of Adventists, much more than other movements that I've seen. Just my personal observation for what it's worth. Now, um, we're gonna, we're gonna develop we this a little compare bit more. compare that to Paul on Mars Hill. Yeah. So, so we're going to develop this more as we go through this study here this week. Um, and, uh, but, but I just think this is an important point to understand that, that Millerite history is about the holy place and preparing the people who are going to give the third angel's message. They're going to receive the first and second and then they're going to give the third. And that's going to happen in our history as well. So... Um, we're going to close with prayer. We got a little bit over time. And let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are very thankful for the study here this morning. Uh, we ask that your spirit can be with us throughout this day, uh, that we can study to show ourselves approved unto God. And Lord, we ask that you can watch over each one, that your angels uh, can protect us from harm, and that uh, we can reflect your character when we are in contact with others today. Um, help us, Lord, to learn the lessons we need to learn. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.